My name is Maarten van Wamel. I'm the team leader of the life skills program at the Malad Nation. And I'm one of the people that started the program four years ago in 2015. 14, excuse me. I'm Paula Schwartz, and I'm the Director of Health and Social Programs at Malahat Nation, and I work with Martin in uh, helping manage and support him in his life skills program. I think we'll start off by uh, maybe if we could just uh, talk a little bit about what is the life skills program, you know, like... What is it? What does it do? Who can participate in that program? And maybe what the aim of the program is. The aim of the program, when we started the program, is we were asked by the former Chief of Council of Malad Nation to create a program that would support members of the nation to live the life they wanted to live, literally. And with the question to help people define where they wanted to go to and walk with people and help them get where they were wanted to be which meant no pushing no pulling walk with people and help people navigate to the direct into the direction they wanted to go to um, with back then the instruction that people were not were free to go where they wanted to go as long as there was movement we've been doing that the program since 2014 we started out with five themes one of them was know where you have come from know where you are, know where you are going, making your mind strong, kwam kwam shkwalawan in halkamitnam, and know who's standing with you to create that program. And we, we started out with the help of uh, an elder from Couch and Tribes, uh, Bill White, and that's how we started the program. Anything I need to add there, Paula, you think? Yeah, well, the, the one of the things I think that has really worked at Malahat and, and with Martin and the participants at the nation is that um, relationships um, were built very, very solidly with Martin and, and the team. And one of the things that I think is really special about this program, their typical life skills programs, is that it was very, very individualized on what a person uh, wanted for a goal and uh, either employment or to go to school or even uh, to improve their personal lives. And the program evolves around what the participant needs are, not a curriculum. Um, and so although the tenets of the program and the goals of the program are, very the, are the same, everybody's individual needs are able to be mapped. So uh, in the program for some people, it would be that determining if they want to go back for education, for employment. For other people, it would be that they wanted to um, be able to go to employment right away. And for other people, uh, it was very acceptable if you just wanted to be um, a better parent or uh, to volunteer. And I think that the basis of the program very much is is on the needs of what an individual wants and not what you know, the nation wants or what a goal of, of the, um, uh, the goal of, you know, that people need to be trained in this or that. And it's a real strength of the program and it's what's made our program very, very successful. And we're aiming for when it comes to uh, what groups, is, is it, um, what's the audience, the target audience? It is residents of the Malad Nation. We used to say members, but it changed it to residents of the nation. So everybody living on, nation, on the reserve um, for 19 and up, because we never ever want this to cannibalize on school going youth. Although we've had young people in that weren't doing anything. And we said we'd rather have them in life skills, uh, doing their driver's license or getting their license um, than for them to not do anything. So sometimes parents actually requested for us to take their kids into life, life, the life skills program because they wanted their kids to do something and not sit at home because they did not want to go to school. Because each individual that's a part of this program is on their own journey and has their own goals in mind. What is what is this program's role in that? Is it helping 
helping the individuals find the resources and get signed up, or how does that work? In general, we have a five-day program. Monday is all about, we call it, personal planning. So that's what's, what's focused on where do you want to go. And the first question when we p ask people where do you want to go, the first quest uh, answer is almost always, I don't know. And, and maybe the first few times it's always yet, getting yet behind that and work towards what is it, and getting people to think further ahead and make a life planning. Second day always has a, either a news or cultural background. What's in the news? What's going on? So we call it, I like to call it critical thinking and culture. What's going on? What do we see? Where do we see um, a solution in the past that actually are applicable to current day uh, challenges? but also nations in the news, so looking at the news, the newspapers, what's in the news, what's going on outside the reserve, to make people critical thinkers, but also look back and look at uh, traditional solutions. Wednesday is driver's license, because almost everybody needs a driver's license, and it is a sneaky way to get people in that wouldn't want to participate in other things of the program to get their license because a lot of people need to and it's a perfect opportunity to not only build what we call learning confidence because we've had quite a lot of people that got their L, tried a long time but never have succeeded so it is building learning confidence and actually creating a willingness to read, to write, to do stuff and to actually do a test so it's building confidence. When uh, Thursday is all about upgrading um, English upgrading and Friday we have a math upgrading program. So we do have a kind of a base in the program but in that program we're constantly adjusting and one I think one of the I think Paula that's one of the strengths of the program is that since people make a plan and we communicate it in social programs everybody kind of knows. So Paula and I work together but people present their personal plan to Paula and to Shana, our manager of social programs. So we constantly are aware of where people want to go. And people know we know. So we're, we have a wraparound support system around people um, to, um, to get them to move. That's actually, and that's what a lot of people say. I always thought I was going to stick here forever. And never, there was never any moment. And people said, you, you guys kind of made me move. And as soon as people start moving, it's really hard to stop. We've seen people getting their license in and said, okay, now I can do this, so I can't have the excuse of I'm stupid because I'm not, because I found out I can. Mm -hmm. And then we're trying to uh, have people serve, serve that wave of success. So that's what we try to, we, call, we like to call learning confidence. Yeah, one of the things that's, that, that's quite big is that um, individuals uh, complete their own personal plans with Martin and they can look very, very different for each yes. person. And it sometimes takes, um, you know, it can take a month, it can take two months for someone to actually put together a solid personal plan for themselves. And that personal plan can be either educational goals, personal goals, employment goals, and that's how it's how the program focuses on the individual needs, is that the program, their, their plan is their own. What a big thing for people is coming in to present their plans to me. They've never, they've never needed to necessarily uh, articulate what mm. they want in life, their goals and the steps necessary and the supports they need to be able to um, achieve their goals. And to present as well, uh, although I, I make it very, very comfortable and relaxed, yeah. it's People get very nervous about that, but it's intentional um, that when people can articulate their plan and their goals and the steps that they need to do uh, with someone other than the instructor, it also makes it real, and it also has an accountability piece for them, but it also increases their support structure, because not only now do they have, the, do they have Martin, um, who's working with them on their plan, they have social programs where if we have resources to support them, and it also gives um, our department the ability just seeing people going, how are you working on this? What can you do? How can we help you? And so that wraparound service so that there's more than just the instructors 
there's actually a team of support around the people who are checking up on them. If they if they're doing really well, we celebrate with them. If they're if they've fallen off a little bit, you have three or four people who are encouraging them to get back up. Um, and also, it's very empowering when um, an individual comes and presents their goals, their plans um, to me after they get over the initial the initial nervousness, because almost everybody is. Um, um, it's very, very empowering for them, and it makes it that much more real for them and that much more attainable. The other thing, too, that I think that, that I just want to add about the flexibility of the program is someone doesn't have to come five days a week. No. We do have single mothers who have children at home. We do have people who maybe cannot commit to five days a week, but maybe what they can do is they might start an upgrading English because they're comfortable there. And they may come to that, you know, Thursday morning for a month and then decide, gee, you know, I might now venture into doing my driver's license. And then they come two days a week. Um, or, and then, well, gee, this is kind of neat. Maybe I'm also going to come on another day. So the flexibility of the program meets the person where they're comfortable and where their need is. And as people gain learning confidence, what happens is that they branch out to then try other parts of yeah. the program. And we allow for that. And it's so interesting, Paula, that you mentioned. Sometimes people feel it fall off the bandwagon for a week or two. And it's interesting, we've had people, and I would, because it's a small reserve, so it's awesome. Part of my work is just driving around too. I should actually get my kilometers uh, now. So driving around, like in a t small little town, you stop and you chat and what's up, and I haven't seen you for a while. And then people are embarrassed, oh yeah, I let you down. And interestingly enough, since I know we know their plan, so you never let me down, I'm just there. And and it's it's awesome to see people focus on their plan and not feel embarrassed to other people or because we're not pushing people to and embarrass them to say, you know what, you let yourself down or whatever. Because usually there's a lot of negative self talk already. But when we say, you know what, I know your plan, I'm there and people walk back in and say, Okay, here I am and and, and they're just on their journey. And we're trying to make people feel like they didn't fall off. You know what? They their their journey slowed down, mm -hmm. and we've seen a lot of people come back and take steps again. With the program here and uh, the individuals, how would you say that you could maybe sort of evaluate that their success in the program, and and along with that, maybe um, if you could elaborate on some of the challenges that you've um, come across over the years. One of the awesome things of creating a personal plan with a long-term vision, a strength, a short strength anal analysis, say these are my strengths that I bring, even cultural teachings that people bring to the table that will help them, and setting uh, short-term or long-term goals, personal long-term goals, short-term goals, and just checking off them. Sometimes we just have a small little checklist. When people, um, when people start with that, they feel horrible because it feels like school and we said this is not for me this is for yourself to see that you're actually climbing the stairs instead of feeling that you never got anywhere we've had people who said oh i'm not there yet and then we look back and they were started signing off on their own achievements and said i'm actually already halfway but i forgot because i'm not there yet and one of and and it helps so a lot of the things are are they actually moving are they, um, are they, um, um, oh, come on, are they uh, achieving their goals, the, the set goals? It helps us to keep, it, keep, keep some check on where people are going, um, and, um, and people themselves, too. Um, sorry, I lost my uh, chain of, uh, train of thought there. You asked, so how do you measure that? Mm -hmm. So movement, seeing movement, and, and literally... Helping people see their own movement, because what we see a lot is that people, when they haven't achieved their end goal, it's really challenging for a lot of people to acknowledge their own steps, the small steps, their movement, and seeing it and looking back and saying, hey, I climbed higher already than I ever thought. Um, 
and um, and that's part of that. That's how we measure. Um, we've seen people achieve, especially in the um, uh, the driver's license. People got their L. Literally, people that said I, that thought they would never ever get it because they had so much test anxiety, reading anxiety, everything. We've had people who said, um, um, I never read the book, the ICBC book, but I really like how we talk about stuff. Repeat, repeat, repeat. And he said, and, and she said, she said, it's weird because we did it the old way because elders would repeat, 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 and you get annoyed, and you did exactly the same. So what we're trying to do is almost culturally appropriate, we call it cultural inquiry, finding old ways for new situations, and, and interestingly enough, um, a lot of people like that and see it. We refer to teachings, but we're trying to apply them. And I'm not indigenous, but I've, we sat down with quite a lot of elders and we've seen it. And we have elders in the, in the background every now and then who say, I don't want to be in front, but I want to be there. And they acknowledge situations and they add their stories to it uh, in the program. Um, and, and it makes people feel confident you can see it we've seen people change from wanting to just have a routine i want to try to be here every day that was one of the goals one of the uh, members had and she has three kids now so she had two of her three kids while she was in the program but she was back in the program a week after she had her kids because she said i need to get back in the routine i know routine helps me sometimes she's only in for an hour and a half with a three-hour program but it's part of her plan to get that routine and get out and um, yeah, that's. Is there anything else we we were measuring? How do you think? How do we know people are successful, Paula? Except for yeah. reaching their own goals and taking the steps. Yeah, yeah, I I agree because success will look different for for every person. For some people, it will be how many people have gotten employed because their goal is they want to be employed. Some people will be they, that they want to. You know, be able to go back to uh, VIU and upgrading program or training program in a certain amount of time. And other people's goals can be, just like Martin said, to be able to establish a routine, which means I'm up and I'm, and I'm at the center at 9 o'clock in the morning, um, you know, three or five days a week. And if they can do that, that's success. Because part of the challenges that, that, that we see is, uh, very much, you know, in the beginning, is even to establish a routine. When you're up in the morning, early, uh, you know, you're at the center at 9 o'clock. For that, that is a big goal for some people because for years perhaps they haven't had a routine where they'd have to be somewhere in the morning. Yeah. It's also working that some, many, of our, many um, of our participants have young children. Yes. And that's a challenge for them. And so on occasion, when you come to our life skills program, sometimes you see all the children around too. It makes it, <laughs> it, makes it even that much more challenging, but it's how, how we can support members, um, you know, even with small children, and they will come. So we do have, you know, people who challenge you that, that it's a huge success that if for a month someone can come every day, the program and, and that is a success for them because uh, that's a really difficult thing for, for some of our members to be able to do. Um, so, you know, people with single parents, and we have single parents or people who have young children, that can be challenging. The other thing that's very, very challenging is that um, many people are feel quite uncomfortable to actually go into any kind of learning environment yes. because um, their past history has not been positive and has in fact been very negative. So being able to have somebody who um, is anxious to come into the program, who is looking forward to coming in and who starts to see that uh, moving forward, setting goals, learning new things is positive, uh, that's a very su uh, huge success uh, for many people. It's just switching that brain. And uh, a lot of people also... Um, have have very very um, little confidence yes. in their own abilities, and so for years and years and years, um, it was safer to actually not even to try than to try because they think they're going to fail. So many times, even a very huge success, and it may take somebody three months, six months, to be able.
able to actually gain some learning confidence that, you know what, I'm going to try this and I can be successful on it. And that is a huge step that we see as success, that people are actually um, attempting to, after years of negative self-talk and saying that they can't uh, do anything or achieve anything, um, to be going, you know what, I'm going to try to do this, and if I fail, it's okay, because I can try again. Yes. Um, and we, and we, I, I always... And, can, can I add to that, that when people said, oh, I did and I failed. And one of the things we're trying, no, you tried and you're not there yet. You'll try again. And it's so interesting, people, or stupid, stupid little sentences, I can do this yet. And people hate us for it, or hate me for it, for saying it. But interestingly enough, eventually, it's people become master of their own thought process and they're starting to understand how how that works and the one of the successes I've seen too is that people start to own up own the program not so long ago we made the big mistake to kind of change ours because somebody asked to and we had quite a lot of backlash from people saying you can't just do that and first response could be yes we can and then interestingly enough it was so awesome because people were just outraged and said, you cannot change our program. It's not your program. And it was so, it was so cool because in a way it was a, sorry for saying it, almost a shit story we got over us. But we realized it's part of, it's ownership. And, and that's exactly what we want, people to feel ownership for this. Um, um, and, and interestingly enough, people that actually did that said, okay, we, we're okay, but we want you to discuss it with us. And critical thinking and feeling the confidence to speak out and speak up is part of that. Having your voice heard is definitely part of that. And we've seen more and more people actually walk into the band office, ask for help, ask for uh, explanation and critical thinking um, and the confidence to do that. It's pretty cool. It's always cool to talk about it. <laughs> I immediately have people in my head. And one of the things, asking for help, maybe that is the most, one of the things we've seen a lot. Two perfect examples was we have one participant, she has six kids. She's 24 with six kids. And her kids and her kids go to school and they have an awesome track record. But her kids are starting to push her to school too. Her youngest come to the program too. And um, she went through a hard time a few months ago, and her kids are starting to push her back, say, Mom, because she wants to be a role model. And unfortunately, when, whenever she doesn't make it, she's really tough on herself. Where her kids said, Mom, did you go to school today? And Because she tells them to go, and she wants to role model. Part of that, I think, is an important part of the program, too. We've seen a lot of, especially moms who want to role model a learning attitude to their kids because they want them to go to school but they're challenged it's challenging for them to show so for them part of going to the program and showing the kids I, you need to go because I go too and role modeling that is a really important part of, um, of, of what we see too yeah. successes mm -hmm. lots of successes <laughs> wonderful Let's talk about what is Indigenous education to you from your perspective. And maybe we could talk a little bit about um, the importance of the life skills training and the building of professional development for our Indigenous peoples, uh, for the nation there. If That's a loaded question, Crystal. <laughs> and I think... I think many, many, many people struggle with what is Indigenous education because it's so varied, dependent on the community and the nation that you work with and the individuals that you work with. And for Malahat, it's the Malahat way. And, and, and we speak specifically often um, in, all of our, in all of our program programs, um, including Life Skills, and it's really the Malahat way. And Indigenous education, when we talk about the Malahat way, is that it's relevant to Malahat members, that, that Malahat history um, is incorporated into all of our programming. It's that the community itself and the knowledge that they hold is what is to share and the strengths um, 
um, their culture. So one of the things that we try and do in, in, in our program, and specifically life skills, is that our participants are the teachers, and they share the stories, and they share um, the strengths of their culture that helps them in their journey and their ways of knowing. Um, we also, Martin does an excellent job on cultural inquiry. So many people will, you know, say, you know, okay, well, how do you do, you know, performance management or, or you know, um, task orientation? And that's an orientation towards, you know, um, the words that we use, you know, as professionals. And our, and our participants go, we have no idea. And Martin will break it down and say, okay, what, happened at, what happens when you have to put together um, a feast? What happens when you need to organize the canoe journey? And people automatically then start talking about what you have to do. And we can translate that, that that really is performance management. That really is task management. And being able to understand that the gifts and the learning and the skills um, in um, our indigenous ways translate in just a different word. Um, and it helps people really understand that they have those skills already. Um, they've done this since time memorial. It's just the wording is different. Uh, but all of, those, all of those tasks are the same. Um, we make sure that culture is um, in everything that we do. So, for example, when Martin's doing driver's license training, right, we are using tools um, and teaching methods based on historical and cultural context. Uh, it means doing, showing, practicing. People, just, people, people don't just um, read books and do quizzes. Um, we um, bring in uh, for, for all of our critical thinking models, for all of our personal planning, um, it all ties back to cultural ways of knowing and historical context. Um, and um, very much so it's based on participants sharing their culture and how that translates into success in the modern world. Um, we use a variety of, of historical contexts from our elders in our community to share those teachings, but also part of, part of um, critical thinking is also bringing in, and, and part of the thing that Martin does so well is, what are other nations doing um, as well? You know, what, where are they finding their strengths, and are there things that Malahat has of similar culture? I think we get into trouble when we try and think that indigenous education is very generalized and we should teach everybody in, you know, one model of, of, of cultural practice. Yeah. Um, because it's very, very individualized based on the community and many times based on the family traditional beliefs. Yeah. And you need to leave room for people because you can close people off if you say this is culturally appropriate. because. Maybe it is for one family or for one area, but it may not be for another one. So it's very much um, inclusive, and it's also very much on what do you do in your families, and not this is what, you know, Coast Salish tradition is. It's here's what some Coast Salish do, what do you do? What's yes. different, what's the same, how can we utilize that? Of course, we always have elders who share their traditional knowledge, and we've had them, you know, from other areas um, as well, as well as elders uh, participate from our own nation in the program, um, who work alongside Martin. Um, but their roles many times are in support, um, and, and very much um, not, this is how things are done. So I think it's a I think it's a model that needs to be very evolving. I think that indigenous education has to be around what individuals feel. It has to be not generalized, and it has to be um, very much accepted that there are different types 
uh, cultural backgrounds for each family, let alone each community, and you need to leave room for that because you can exclude people if you and say that it is only one way. Because um, all of our Indigenous teachings um, vary from family to family, and it's just leaving room to make sure that you respect and honor all of those beliefs and all of those strengths. Uh, it's very much getting away from traditional teaching methods where, you know, teachers or instructors stand in front of a classroom and talk and people read and there's tests. Uh, it's very experiential in, in, all of our, in all of our program where people practice, do, say, practice, do, say. Um, it's hands-on. Um, it's making information relevant, and it's always tying it back to traditional cultural practices and how, in today's modern world, um, there are strengths, and we can learn lessons from that, and we can excel. I really like, Paula, how you said, because it time and time again, I realized when I started this program, when I became the instructor, I said no three times to the chief back then. And uh, eventually I said, okay, why would you ask me? And one of his reasons was, you're an immigrant. You probably understand our people way more when they go off reserve because they feel immigrants in their own country. Had me heard say about the challenges. Um, and the other thing is, sometimes I feel that the group is teaching me more. And maybe that's a benefit for me not being, new, being fairly new to the country and to indigenous culture because everything... I needed to learn. So um, I part of it was just being very curious and inviting people to speak. What I've seen is that a lot of people didn't want to talk about culture. And what the interesting things we've seen in, in the group was actually an elder telling people, yes, you can tell him about a big house. Yes, you can tell what happened. You cannot tell, sing your song. You may not want to share your names, maybe, but you can tell what a big house is. What And just saying it's sacred, he said, it's just insecurity. So part of what he and that was so awesome was, was help. So when you talk about indigenous education, it, what he did was giving participants the confidence to actually teach me. So it was actually the other way around. So when indigenous education, I would love to have the teaching white people, sorry, Juanitem, uh, <laughs> about culture and feeling the confidence to do that in a respectful way and making me, because I've, I always said, you know what, I'm a, I'm a child, you need to teach me, but you cannot ask me, blame me that I'm disrespectful to your culture if you haven't taught me how to behave first. It's like a child. Teach them how it's done, say it again, and they can say, now you need to stick to the rules. And interestingly enough, we see that now. I've been teased so many times. It was so much fun. I've been teased. Shauna and Paula have laughed at me, said, really? Even after years, I would say something, and they said, really? You still don't get it? And I And being open to that, to me as an instructor, is part of it. So I feel blessed by being totally ignorant. Um, but I am curious. I am curious of nature. So, and people hate me for it every now and then, or what? I push them just a little bit. One of our participants, Lisa, posted on Facebook. He said, Marta van Wamel, I hate you for pushing me out of my comfort zone. And Marta van Wamel, I love you for doing it because now I have my license. So that's what we, so there's a lot of fun, there's a lot of joking. Um, I, we push people out of their comfort zone and people find that they'll survive out of their comfort zone. And that's what, because comfort zones are at this very moment for a lot of people not very effective. Mm -hmm. and, and it's really cool to see how people feel the confidence to step out. Mm -hmm. yeah. Really cool. <laughs> so indigenous education to me, I would love that it would also be indigenous people teaching non-indigenous people how to be respectful because uh, else people might in their ignorance might do stupid things that are felt like very disrespectful but not meant that way not intentional but um, I, I, I would love for that to happen too so that's what we're trying at this very moment and that's what's happening in the, in the nation I think nice, nice. well thank you thank you very much for sharing all those words um, that's wow um 
And before we wrap up, I just was wondering um, if you could maybe share what um, what your vision um, for um, maybe for your program and moving forward over the next uh, five to ten years. What would you like to see? How would you like to see it grow? Or would you? My personal goal for the next five years is that is that. Malahat Nation will need a life skills program. That our community will, and individuals in our community will uh, be successful. That um, after they graduate from school, that they will have a plan, and that they will succeed in all of their adventure, you know, uh, goals, their their dreams for themselves, and have the confidence. Through all of our programs, I we would like to see that uh, we're going to expand to a leadership model, which is teaching leadership so that we can start working with our people on management, you know, so that they can be our future leaders. And our goal oftentimes at the nation is to work ourselves out of jobs. So ideally, I would like to see that every every nation member is to confident enough to be able to go after their goals, go after their dreams, have the support of the nation to do that, and lead very successful personal and career and uh, private lives. So that's my goal. Mm. I, I agree to Paula to, I went out, <laughs> not because I'm driving... Three days a week, I'm driving 150k to go to Mill Bay, so my loyalty is with the nation. But I would love for people to feel the confidence to not need me anymore. I want to be their friend. I don't want to be their and supporter. And I will always, uh, I always, I will support. But I would love for people to um, be independent. At one of my, as a as an instructor or a facilitator, I always shy. I, one of my, 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 my main values is independence. And that's part of what we're trying to do, creating belonging, ability, and autonomy. And I do believe my dream is that people will be, feel the confidence to be teaching whatever we're doing. And, and maybe call us every now and then. Can you do the this and this part? And, and I would love to do that. But I, I would love for nation members to do 60% of it and then call me for a specific thing. We don't need you for the rest. We just need you for this part because that's what you're yeah. good at. And not because, what, whatever, as, as a leadership developer because that's my background. And, and I would love that. And, and, and we're seeing that. People come and say, I need to have my uh, first aid upgraded. Before we did, we did the program, we offered it, then people walked in. And then people found out, oh, mine wasn't actually, was still, was still good. Um, what I would love, what I like is that people walk up to us now. Uh, one of our, my participants not so long ago said, I don't know enough about residential school. Our elders don't really want to talk about it because it's too painful. Can we go to Penelica and visit the residential school? And I said, isn't that too painful for you? She said, no, I wasn't there. I've seen a lot of hurt. But I'm finding that I don't have enough information to teach my kids. So she's taking the initiative. And I don't know how to do it because that could be very traumatic. But three, four people say, yeah, I want to visit a residential school. I want to see. I want to feel. I want to know what it is. And it's so interesting because first, I almost very paternalistic said, oh, that's very traumatic. She says, that's not up to you to decide. I want to see what happened there. I want to learn about it. So interestingly enough, it's, it's starting to shift. People are starting to feel that responsibility, the ownership, and telling me what they want. And that's my dream, um, independence. Yes. And can people reaching their goals, because we set about 10-year goals. People drive it to tell us we're crazy that we're setting 10-year goals. But um, I would love for, for people to just reach their goals. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, Okay, well, was there any final uh, thoughts or, or ideas that you'd want to share before we wrap up? Um, Paula, you mentioned uh, a, a cultural inquiry. That's one of the things, if I can just mention one thing. While we were working in the beginning of the program, um, Bill White and I did something, and afterwards we were looking at each other and said, whoa, that was a good session. 
and it was all about, Paul mentioned something about um, uh, uh, project management, and people, you could see people kind of fade out. Words, oh, that's Nathan words, we don't want to hear about it. And they kind of, and, and we had a session, that session, where Bill asked me to explain what, in your opinion, is project management, and I explained in, in a, almost a definition, and then he translated in how do you think our people from Cowichan would go to the Fraser River, go fishing, and do you think they just threw everything in their canoes and started pedaling? No, they prepared for it for half a year. And we would look at who would be the project managers. And people say, oh, the elders. And they said, no, no, no. He said, no, no, those were the time managers. They said when it was time to go. But the chiefs were the project management and the family heads were the problem. They made sure that the nets were ready. They made sure that the dipping nets were ready. They made sure that the canoes were ready. And and so we translated the project and it was so cool because two months later we had one participant who started talking about, oh yeah, it's project management and planning. And, and she used a wording that she didn't want to use before because they felt that they were not hers. She owned them. And she immediately, she not only understand, understood exactly what it was, but she used her, them in her daily um, work. And interestingly enough, that is what we're trying. We, and Bill and I looked back and I said, what the heck happened? It worked. And we called it, because it looked like appreciative inquiry. We called it a cultural inquiry. Looking back at your own culture and practices and finding solutions to daily, to current day challenges. And, and it, that worked really, really well. So that's what we're trying to do constantly. So that's the... the and we kind of called it cultural inquiry. That's why uh, Paula used it. And uh, yes, that was, uh, that was a good one. <laughs> Anything else, Paula, that you wanted to add? Uh, we're just grateful for the opportunity yes. uh, to talk about our program. Because I think that Life Skills doesn't do... Title Life Skills doesn't do it justice. Uh, everybody likes the title Life Skills. Uh, it's about it's about empowerment, it's about independence, autonomy, and belonging. Yes, and personal leadership. Yes. And personal leadership. Yeah.